Okay, good evening. Well, good morning. We're just about at the end of the semester. I know you're all cheering at this. So we're just going to cover one more thing on matrices and next week we're going to do complex numbers. So, yeah, so let's talk about matrices one more time. I'll just clear this and clear, clear all drawings. Okay, there we go. So matrices are bread and butter, unfortunately, for an engineer. I mean, we use them all over the place. The major places we use them are modeling, which is cool. Uh, we use them in control systems. Control systems. Might change this pen in a second. Networks. So that can be things like neural nets or just networks like I'm trying to figure out trying to figure out that, um, or uh, timetabling and things like that. And also just general problem solving. Um, I mean, one the, nowadays, in fact, why use matrices and th things of like backends of computer programming, we, nowadays with all this database program, effectively we're using matrices there. But, Okay, so but some people say, can we actually simplify it? I mean, if we're doing a big matrixing, is there any way of reducing the amount of data that we have to actually process? Is there a shortcut in the data? And of course there is. We call them eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Now, it might not seem it at first, but basically, if I have a matrixing, I don't necessarily want to process all of that matrixing all of that time because it chews up processing power and things like that. So what I can actually do is I can reduce it down to an eigenvector or an eigenvalue. And this actually acts if you choose the right volume value, this actually acts as a summary of this entire vector, so we can then use it in processing. Okay, so that's cool. My opinion, well, I don't know about you, I think that's cool. But it's amazing where um, vectors actually, or oh, sorry, matrices actually turn up. I mean, like when I was doing. Um, Okay, let's actually do research and things. Let's actually try one. Here's a common one nowadays, encryption. So nowadays we try and code. Um, nowadays, not only do we have to have the data, but we have to make sure that nobody else gets our data. And that's actually quite an important thing. And one of the ways is to stick your data into a table. Dun, 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 dun. Do a mathematical process to that and then you get a result of that um, so this is your encrypt so you basically you stick all of your data into a matrix you multiply it by an encryption matrix and then you get your coded version and then if you take the coded version you multiply it by the encrypt inverse then you get back plain text and so nowadays we're using it for lots of other things just besides engineering my favorite one which again deals with encryption is if you're sending data over the internet how do you know it's secure and what you need is you the most secure version of coding is what we call the one time pad. And men, one time pads use random numbers. And you must only use these random numbers once. In fact, um, it's one of these things that's actually come out recently that Russia or Soviet Union during the Cold War decided that it was spending too much time making brand new random numbers for one time pads, so they actually recycled their one time pads. And the Americans were reading them. Not all of them, but enough to make it worthwhile. So the question is 
how do you make a random number? And mathematically, in mathematics, it's you can't do random numbers. You can do pseudo-random numbers and highly complex random numbers, like I use a, a chaos encryption algorithm if I want to have good random numbers, but it's still only pseudo-random. It's repeatable. How do you get totally, utterly, completely random numbers? One of the so, um, companies in the world, what it does is it has a rack, and on it, it's got a couple of hundred lava lamps. Do you remember these things? These are lamps like that, you know, like this. And they've got blobs of red liquid in them, usually red or orange. And these will blob and these will float up and float down. So what they do is they have 200 odd lava lamps. And then they have a camera down here that takes photos of these lava lamps. And what they can then do is if they can say this is 70% lava, um, lava and this is 50%, they can turn this into a matrice. Well, let's see how I'm raise up. So what they can actually do is that they can turn this into a matrix. So 70%, 60%, uh, 50%, I think, 80%, and so on. So they end up with a matrix, quite a large matrix. They, I don't know, 15 by 15, 20 by 20, whatever, however big they want it. And then if you do some operation to this, like an inverse, hey, suddenly, these lava lamps are totally random, but if you do an inverse to it, like a matrix operation, then suddenly, even if just this lamp varies slightly, then the whole matrix changes. I'm sure you've noticed this by now. That, so yeah, matrices turn up all over the place, especially in control systems. And even if you're trying to work more interesting control systems like genetic out programming, um, or what's the other one, neural nets and things, you'll still, you're engineers, you're going to meet matrices. So anyway, um, next week we'll be doing complex numbers. I've got some problems for you online to try um, using the last of our matrice skills, and I'll give you some tips on how to do tests and exams next week as well. So anyway, uh, good luck, and well, let's figure it out. Good luck, and yeah. See you at the flip side.